my name is Naomi and I work at the Scott Perley Research Institute, which is on Lensfield Road here in Cambridge. My colleague Laura has spent the year working in our archive collections on an important group of papers relating to the Antarctic in the 1950s. Laura, can you tell us a bit more about these papers? Sure. So I've been working uh, on the papers or the administrative papers of the Transantarctic Expedition, uh, which was planned and undertaken between 1955 and 1957. Okay, so having worked on the papers for a year now, what, are there any particular bits that you're fond of? I think the whole collection is fascinating. I think it's very difficult. We get asked that question a lot in archives. What, what individual thing or what particular thing is your favourite? And, and you, it's really difficult to choose. I think with a, with a collection like this, um, which is very much the administrative papers of how an expedition is put together, what, what they took down, um, the communications that came out of it, how they communicated with the world while they were down there. I think really the best thing about it, I think for me, the favourite thing about it really is it's just a really great snapshot of the 1950s. So what was the um, aim of this expedition? So the expedition was the brainchild of a man called Vivian Fuchs, whose uh, nickname was Bunny. Um, he worked uh, after the war in Antarctica, as part of the Falkland Islands Dependency Survey. Um, and one day was thinking, thinking out loud, I think, and decided that he would be the man. He wanted to do the first crossing of Antarctica. Um, others had tried, um, notably Shackleton's the main aim of his Imperial Transantarctic um, expedition in 1914, was to try and get across the entire continent. But unfortunately, um, he didn't even make landfall and wasn't able to undertake that task and no one had attempted it since. What sort of people were put together in this team? So um, it was a very interesting team. Um, some have had Antarctic experience and some hadn't. Quite a few of the scientists hadn't. Um, Bunny Fuchs put together a team um, of people he knew that he could work with and would work well together in cold conditions. So that so much of the focus of the expedition is obviously on the main characters, very interesting, but it's very obvious from the papers, actually most of the papers are coming out of the expedition office in London, which is run by um, a group of very, um, very strong-willed women, I think, who held behind the scenes the expedition all together, sorted out the office, got the logistics all together, and were underpinning the expedition from a different point of view. And that's not always the story that you hear in um, a lot of the biographies and the traditional narratives about expeditions from that age. So the other uh, person involved with the uh, expedition uh, was Edmund Hillary. Um, the famous explorer. Um, Vivian got in touch with him to see if he would arrange um, setting up a base on the Ross Sea side of Antarctica and uh, searching out a route and laying food and fuel depots for the main party to pick up once they had gone past the South Pole and were attempting to reach the Ross Sea. Now that first winter in the Antarctic I think it wasn't quite as easy as maybe they thought it would be. No, all the best laid plans have gone slightly wrong as it is very difficult to travel through ice in the Weddell Sea to reach the Antarctic continent. Um, they were delayed travelling down in the pack ice which meant they got to Antarctica quite late in the summer season um, um, which didn't help their cause. Um, also the ice conditions meant that the main party had to leave again quite quickly and were unable to help them to set up and, and, and unload as fully as they would have wanted. So they left a small team on the continent um, with all the stores unloaded and left on the ice near the edge of the continent. And the team had the task of bringing it up onto the plateau to start building a base for the main party who were to arrive the next year. Um, weather conditions weren't kind uh, and they ended up having to live in one of the containers that contained uh, a snowcat on the ship on the way down. Unfortunately, there was a large storm and quite a few of the stores they had were lost to sea and they lost a large amount of their fuel. Fortunately, not their food, so they could survive, but they had to ration their fuel, which meant that they, despite having some shelter on the continent, actually spent most of the winter asleep in tents outside the crates uh, in very, very poor conditions. So what sort of food do they have when they're down in the Antarctic? So... The very, the very first wintering party didn't have an enormous amount, but what they did have were a lot of 
dried canned tinned foods and goods so they would live a lot a lot of dried meat and off uh, dried vegetables and canned goods and would have to find ingenious ways to make that food palatable and there's a nice story about one of the members producing some very tasty minty peas one night and everyone being very appreciative and asking where on earth he got the mint from um, and he uh, with a bit of I think uh, tongue-in-cheek said that he'd been using the toothpaste for the last week to flavour that food which I think shows and gives a bit again a bit of a flavour of the conditions they were in and the need to adapt to the circumstances that they found themselves in but it was a very basic food and it was very much designed with um, survival in mind rather than taste day but it was very repetitive and not particularly tasty I don't think uh, the one occasion that I found in the records where food was a bit more exciting and the thing that is a bit of a tradition in, in Antarctic circles is a midwinter uh, feast, which they all enjoyed uh, in the main hut in Shackleton the winter before they set off on the main journey. And this was a full three course meal, as you can see, and very much different to how they would have been surviving day to day. But I think it would have given them a something to look forward to, and something to focus, and it's always worth celebrating the point in the year that is the darkest because you know beyond that point the sun is coming back. So is this the same sort of food they took when they went off on the journey to cross the continent? It's similar food so sledging and being in the snowcats I think they had a very much reduced ration as far as um, the records that I've seen within the collection show they had pemmican which is a mix of uh, dried meat and fat which quite a few of the earlier expeditions used on the continent they had sledging biscuits and tea I think sort of hot drinks and, and warm chocolate but that was kind of it for the main crossing. So were the um, team from New Zealand who were in the Ross Sea party with Hillary were they eating the same foods? Well to an extent um, but planning in London sent uh, list down to Hillary and the team there and they experimented with the food and, uh, and suggestions that the, the British team had been given and swiftly decided that it wasn't actually to their taste and that it was a bit basic and that possibly they could be a bit more inventive with the food that they took down to the base they were establishing in the Ross Sea and also to take with them on the journey whilst they were laying depots on the way to the South Pole. So they added a few more luxurious items and were a bit more thoughtful about what they wanted to include in their rations. I think they found the British approach to exploration was slightly dated and a bit more in touch with the era of Scott and Shackleton than the modern age and modified their supplies to reflect that. So the crossing itself, did it go without a hitch? The crossing uh, on paper, yes, they did an excellent job and they got across. It was a very successful story. But I think the day to day, certainly coming out of Shackleton Base, which was the British side of the expedition from the Weddell Sea, the um, airplanes had been across the landscape and they picked out a route to try and get through the first section of the journey. Um, and found it was incredibly slow and difficult because they the whole the area was very crevassed and difficult to traverse on large machinery. Um, on the other side of the continent, Hillary was busy laying depots with his team um, and had fairly few issues. In fact, their side of the journey went so particularly well that they reached a point where um, they had to make a decision whether they were going to turn back, which was the plan, or whether they should push on to reach the South Pole. And Hillary, I think, being the adventurer at heart, didn't want to miss the opportunity to get to the pole. And so pushed on and got there before uh, Fuchs and his team. Uh, in fact, 15 days or so before Fuchs and his team, before he then flew back out down to Scott Base with his part of the expedition being done. Um, the press got wind of this and made quite a lot uh, uh, of the issue and wondered whether there was a conflict between Fuchs and Hillary. Well whether all, all publicity is good publicity but it generated a lot of publicity for the expedition um added add a bit of kind of um, general interest to the journey uh, but once once Fuchs had got to the pole it was fairly plain sailing and he followed the path that uh, Hillary had set for him all the way down to Scott Base and they got the team across in 99 days arriving on the other side or on the 2nd of March in 1958 and whilst crossing obviously had not been easy it was an enormous achievement 
to, to get a team across the continent, to be the first team across the continent. Quite a lot of information about the depth of the ice sheet was, was, was found, a lot of weather and geology, um, meteorology work was done. Um, and interestingly, they had quite a, a, an interesting physiology part of the programme. They were very interested to see how people um, coped with conditions in Antarctica, what kind of food was needed to sustain them um, and what clothing you know, would be best. And hoping that research went on to inform quite a lot of other expeditions that, that, that ran afterwards. Um, I would just encourage people that if, if you have an interest in the 1950s and if you have an interest in um, exploration more broadly, um, to be aware that we have collections of that, this, this sort in the Institute. And the museum has many objects, um, some from the Transantarctic expeditions, but lots of other expeditions as well, um, which you can come down and explore on Lensfield Road.